I'm Catherine Pompilio with an episode of Chatter for June 5th, 2022. For today's episode, the team at Lawfare decided to cross-post this week's episode of Chatter, a podcast hosted by David Priest and Shane Harris that features in-depth discussions with fascinating people at the creative edges of national security. Today's Chatter episode is entitled The Secrets of Gay Washington with Jamie Kerchick. In the episode, Harris sat down with Kerchick to discuss the secret history of gays and lesbians in the Capitol, as well as the history of secrecy in which they played pivotal roles. This is Chatter. This is Chatter. I'm Shane Harris. This week, author Jamie Kerchick on the secret history of gay Washington. We learn a lot about each president through their relationship to this issue of homosexuality. One of the first executive orders that Eisenhower signs is 10450, which bars gay people from working for the federal government, but more importantly, at least in terms of this conversation, is it denies them security clearances. It basically makes it very difficult for a gay person to advance at all in this city. One of the things I learned in this book was that a stereotypical gay male activity was antique collecting. So they would say that he, you know, he enjoys collecting antiques, and that was sort of a wink and a nod. Jamie Kerchick, welcome to Chatter. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Shane. Uh, We were going to be in person, but um, God's wrath opened up on this gay, sinful city of Washington. (laughs) And his his exiled us to be on Zencaster, um, but it's good to see you. Um, how are you feeling? You just like birthed like five babies with this giant, amazing book, Secret City. How are you feeling about it? I'm feeling very excited. Uh, you spend so much time working on something, and you really want to share it far and wide, yeah, with as many people as possible. So I appreciate you taking the time. And one of the major themes of this book is espionage, and so I knew yes. I knew that I knew I, I knew that you would be someone I had to go to with it. So you are you were right. Uh, and that is one of the big themes we're going to talk about. And you actually have a whole wonderful kind of thesis of the book, or maybe one of many, but it's like the, the notion that in the secret world of espionage and in Washington, in which secrecy is currency and you derive power from it, there are so many interesting stories to tell about gay men and lesbians who have to themselves have had to live secret lives. Mm. Uh, and so and, and that's just a wonderful kind of parallel and becomes such a critical part of the story. Um, And we'll get into many of those great spy stories. Um, But first, you know, you've been working on this book a long time. I've known you for years, I should say, uh, Mm. for for much of the time that I've been in Washington. Uh, And we have a lot of, you know, friends in common. Uh, And you've been working on this book for a long time. I remember when you first, I feel like it it was many years ago when I learned Mm. that you were going to tackle this and thinking, you said you were going to write a gay history of Washington and thinking like, God, that's great. Like somebody should do that. Mm. And now here it is. So talk about the genesis of this book. So I think it was sort of subconsciously planted when I was actually a student at Yale. And, um, you know, Cold War history is really my passion. And just the Cold War as a epoch has always fascinated me. Um, all, all details of it, you know, and I all aspects of it. Like I love, you know, spy movies. My mm-hmm. favorite movie is uh, The Lives of Others, you know, about. Oh, about, that's such a great movie. Yeah. Um, I worked for Radio Free Europe, which is one of the great sort of legacy Cold War institutions. I lived in Berlin, which was the center of the Cold War, so it's just kind of my bag. Mm-hmm. Um, but at Yale, I my one of my uh, professors there was John Lewis Gaddis, who's the real the real dean of Cold War history, um, and also George Kennan's biographer. And he was my academic advisor, and he was teaching a well, he teaches, I believe he still does a, a seminar on the art of biography. Mm-hmm. on how to write biographies. And we would we would read a biography every week in class. And then the final term paper had to be our own biography of anyone living or dead whose papers were at Yale. And I was very lucky in that Larry Kramer, the great uh, rabble-rousing act-up activist and playwright, um, and famously a Yale graduate, he had just donated his papers to Yale. And so I chose Larry, and I started working through his papers and went down to New York and interviewed him and got to know him quite well. Um, and that was kind of like a, maybe like a foreshadowing. It was sort of a merging 
of these two ent- intellectual interests of mine of you know, Cold War American political history, foreign policy, Cold War foreign policy, history, all that um, with gay history mm-hmm. and the role of gay people in history. And Larry was, um, you know, a very outspoken individual and um, yeah, we would keep in touch that. and I would come visit him and he would always, you know, I'd send him my articles, what I was writing, what I was doing in Washington because um, I, I, le- I graduated college and went to work at the New Republic magazine and Larry was insistent being, why are you writing about anything else but gay people? This is, hmm. you know, this is, this is when gay marriage was still being debated and he was just insistent about, about this. And he was also very insistent about the importance of gay history. There was a um, a, a uh, academic program at Yale that his brother had donated the money for that was named after him. It was a it was meant to be um, a gay history an- initiative. It ended up being a sort of queer theory initiative, and that's that's a whole other story. And Larry got into massive fights with the university, but he was very um, passionate about gay history and why it should be studied. And I think him, you know, needling me for years and years basically got me to sort of realize, hey, you know what, there's, there's, there's a book here. Yeah. And all these phenomena, all these um, presidencies and eras and aspects of American history that we all think we know, there's sort of a hidden gay element to them, right? Mm-hmm. Whether it's McCarthyism, whether it's the Reagans, whether it's the Kennedys, whether it's um, the OSS, the FBI, uh, J. Edgar Hoover. I mean, it's just this kind of omnipresent subject that's lurking there in the shadows. Um, and no one had put it all together. You know, there's there was one book on the Lavender Scare, which was the period in the 1950s when gay people were purged from government. But that's that it's 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 a fine book, but it's a it's a short academic book. There had mm-hmm. there had there'd been no sort of all-encompassing uh, look into this subject that would try to tie everything together into one book. And so I decided to, to do it. And here it is. And I think what gives this book, I mean, it, even a, you know, I described it and it's, you know, it, it's on the cover. It says the hidden history of gay Washington. Um, of course, you're right there. You are writing about elements of history in the city of Washington about gay people. But this, right. the ambition of this is a national yeah. history. We're talking yeah. about Washington through the national lens. Yeah. And, you know, how you you did something which I thought was really smart and helpful for the reader, which is that you break it up into chapters by presidency. Yeah. And you, so you're viewing it as, you know, a series of administrations. Talk about that a little bit, because I thought, you know, there were there were so many ways you could construct a narrative out of mm. this. But to, to just break it by chapters by the president. Why did you decide mm. to do it that way? Well, I think for better or worse, we as Americans understand our history or our political history through the presidencies. Right. So there's the yeah, FDR. That. Yeah, there's the FDR era. There's the Eisenhower era. There's Kennedy and Camelot. There's the Nixon, and that's just how we do it. And I'm sure there are historians who might not like that and say that it's it's all wrong. But in trying to write a book for a popular audience, right? This is this is a book that I want anyone who's interested in politics, American history, espionage. Mm-hmm. Um, I want that general reader, you know, straight or gay. I think I don't yeah. think you have to be gay to be interested in this. Um, no, I, not I, at all. Yeah. yeah. So I was I was writing for that audience, and um, I also think we learn a lot about each president through their relationship to this issue of homosexuality, Mm -hmm. right? I think we learn something about FDR's character in the way that he deals with the tragedy of Sumner Wells, who was his undersecretary of state, um, who was gay and his career was destroyed over it. I think we learn something about FDR and how he handles it. I think we learn something about, you know, JFK, who's probably the most comfortable president around gay people. And there are interesting reasons for that, right? So for me, just trying to take this massive subject that had so many different angles, I wanted to impose some kind of organization on it. So as, as a writer, it just made it easier to yeah. say, you know, just to have my note, you know, have my, my, my folders of all my notes, you know, everything that's happening in the FDR era, it goes into that folder, right? Everything under Nixon goes into that folder. And so it just, it made it easier to organize the writing of it. And I hope for readers, it makes it a little, a little um, easier to read. And that's, I think, I think it does, because I think you're so right that people form impressions about American history through the lens of presidents. And it's also a really helpful way of reminding the reader, okay, FDR, this is 
quite some time ago and you walk into it thinking, all right, I have a sense of what the mores and the traditions mm. may have been. And you actually upend a lot of that. It's surprising in some cases how permissive, if I can use that word, uh, or tolerant, which is, I guess it was a loaded word too, some of these organizations were. But like even thinking about the evolution of gay marriage, I mean, I think so many people go to Obama saying, I've evolved on the issue, right? I mean, presidents right. become sort of very, like, they're sort of bookmarks for us in places yeah. where we kind of, you know, say this is how we've progressed along the spectrum of any number of issues. So I think that that works really well. Um, so let's get into some of these stories because there are just, there are so many in here. And I mean, and there were, there were people who I had never heard of. I mean, mm -hmm. characters I have never encountered who were hugely consequential. And I'm thinking like, okay, this person needs to be a movie. That mm. guy needs to be a TV <laughs> series. That guy needs a book of his own. Mm. Um, um, but let's, let's let's start with fdr let's do this chronologically and and here um maybe let's start first with more less a person than an idea you have this chapter in F the fdr act called patriotic homosexuals mm. um which i have to admit when i started reading it i was like i'm not sure where he's going with this and so it was not what i expected so what is the concept of a patriotic homosexual and how did the government envision using them so I came across this memo that was circulating among officers of the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, which was the predecessor to the CIA. Right. And a proposal had been made to them by a research institute called the Center for the Study of Sexual Variants. And they basically studied homosexuals. Love they it. interviewed them and whatnot. This was back when, you know, homosexuality was deemed a mental illness and right. gays were seen as a social problem, right? And this organization was actually quite enlightened for its time, and they mm. were studying sexual variants. And one of the members of this organization wrote a letter um, basically su suggesting, you know, because there are so many homosexuals in the Nazi party, which is a whole other story we can get into, it was this, right. belief, this real serious belief that the Nazi hierarchy was just riddled with homosexuals. And this is sort of a cultural, you know, I think, I think today actually there's still a, um, I mean, you look at the movie the, or, or, or the musical, the, 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 the producers, mm -hmm. you know, with, with Springtime for Hitler. I mean, this is like mm -hmm. a real strong cultural association we have between homosexuality and fascism. Right. And we might kind of joke about it, you know, like in the producers, but this was actually something seriously believed. And the OSS commissioned two, stu two psychological studies of Adolf Hitler by Harvard um, psychiatrists, in which they actually go on at length about this belief that maybe Hitler is a repressed homosexual, that he's surrounded by homosexuals, that homosexuals are more likely to support a revolutionary movement because they have less, uh, less to lose mm -hmm. um, or less to live for, basically. They can take a risk. Mm. Anyway, um, so this, this pitch was made to the OSS that they should seriously consider recruiting patriotic homosexuals, right, who can't serve in the military, because this is when the formal ban on gay military service begins, starts with World War II. It was actually not used that much because they just needed every warm body they could get in the military. So lots of gay people served in the military. And in fact, World War II was a, a major moment in gay American history in that it, it sort of was for the first time, it was, it was when a lot of gay people realized, oh, wow, like there are other gay people like me. I'm not just alone in this. Um, so this proposal was made to the to the America's first civilian intelligence agency. It didn't really go anywhere, or there's no there's no evidence that it really went anywhere. But I kind of have the paper trail, and it's interesting to see the kind of back and forth among these officials where they're actually taking this into consideration. And there were, I do write later in that chapter, I do write about um, some gay spies in the OSS. Mm. Um, uh, and there's one particularly fascinating guy named Donald Downs, who was yeah. a, a Yale graduate. And we'll get to him. OK, yeah. Uh, but the idea here was that they were going to use them like to infiltrate organizations. Yeah. Right? right. I mean, they were right. going to. And was it was it. Should we think of that as the way we think of like honeypots in the sense that they're trying to sexually entrap potential intelligence targets? I think that's one of the ideas. But really what's interesting and you see this repeatedly in the book is this understanding that homosexuality exists in every social strata, right? That there are wealthy gays, there are poor gays, there are gays in Germany, there are gays in America, and that therefore gays can be very useful in sort of infiltrating all different sorts of social uh, milieu. 
Um, and this comes up repeatedly in sort of writings about homosexuality when it's still kind of this mystery. Um, but yes, that seemed to be the idea that um, that the Nazis in particular were sexually degenerate uh, and, there, and therefore we can use our own sexual degenerates um, for, our, for patriotic purposes. And, and, and there's also the, the, this sense, it seems, in some of these organizations that there is just kind of a gay network uh, of, of people, of these like-minded people who themselves are kind of their own little intelligence apparatus. And you have a quote that I loved reflecting on this from, from somebody from the time saying, we had recently learned that there was a homosexual underground through which information traveled even more rapidly than by the channels of the Catholic Church and various Jewish organizations. Which yeah. It's a rather problematic statement. Well, no, this is um, actually, this is in reference to, this is when World War II was going on. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah. She's, so she's referring to the kind of the Jewish relief agencies that were sending- oh, the relief me- agencies. That okay. were sending messages about the Holocaust, the impending yes. Holocaust back through- to the West, um, and they had a very good, you know, these had very good network. And obviously, the Catholic Church has its own network, right? There's parishes and priests all over Europe, and so she was actually comparing kind of the the sort of gay uh, grapevine, if you will, yeah, to yeah. these actually really impressive uh, informational networks of the Jewish relief agencies in the Catholic Church. Which is so interesting because I think, I mean, you know, there's, I mean, you know, it's often referred to there being like, you know, a gay mafia in D.C. Right. And maybe that's overstated, but obviously gay people socialize with one another mm-hmm. and they have their own networks. But it's fascinating to me the way that <clears throat> this um, burgeoning intelligence organization identified this group of people as a networked kind of. Uh, um, entity and said, mm. like, yeah, maybe we should tap into that. And the OSS, as you write in the book was actually remarkably tolerant of homosexuals. It didn't, it, it did not, it's, I guess it's not how we would think of being a 1940s right. organization and how they yeah. reacted to gay people. I mean, it's not like they were flying rainbow flags, but right. we, we yeah. do know of the presence of a, of a you know, a, a relative handful of gay people. And that had really had to do, I think, with, with, again, with sort of this wartime ethos, particularly that, you know, Wild Bill Donovan, as, as he was named, who was the founder of the OSS. He had this sort of, spaghetti on the wall, you know, approach where we're just going to, we're going to hire communists. We're going to hire, you know, anyone to fight Nazi Germany. And if there's a couple homosexuals in the bunch, then, you know, whatever, all for the, yeah, all it, for it the doesn't group. matter. It's yeah. not important to them. Right. Yeah. And you have a line too, where you're writing about the OSS and talking about how, um, the reason for the tolerance, albeit brief in duration and limited in scope, was pragmatic, as gays were seen to possess qualities beneficial for espionage, which yeah. we just talked about. And then this line, for the homosexual in mid-20th century America, deception and keeping secrets were matters of basic survival. Yeah, And that really is a theme running through the whole book, is that gay people had to learn to keep secrets. And in Washington, secrecy was power, and which is yeah. not to say that they it was the same kind of secrets they were keeping, but this notion of power and imbalance of power plays so interestingly when you're talking about gay people who themselves have to learn how to live double lives. Right. Right. And you would think that this would make them, or you would think that this would make the government perhaps more receptive to the idea that maybe gay people could be better spies and maybe we should be recruiting them for this. And unfortunately that's not what happens obviously after the, after the war certainly. And we can get later yeah. get into the purges that would follow. But So you alluded to Donald Downs. Mm. Uh, so talk about Donald Downs. This is one of these people who jumps off the page and mm. you think, my God, I mean, this is, it's such a good story, but who, who was he? So he was a Yale graduate, um, like many of the early generation of OSS. It was basically right. a Yale institution and uh, a private school teacher um, who basically found his way into the service of the OSS, a very patriotic, um, anti-Nazi figure. And his first job that I write about, really one of the first jobs the OSS did was they want they had to penetrate the um, neutral embassies in the United States, primarily that of Spain. And uh, he basically recruited all these handsome young men uh, to basically go out and uh, seduce the secretaries at the various neutral embassies and the female secretaries, the female secretaries, yes, yes, to get them, you know, to go on dates, to get information, to basically um, find their way in. 
and uh, his reports that he wrote about the Spanish embassy are just, um, it's like great literature. I'm just, I'm just going to, I mean, he's describing Please. Yeah. The, the Francoist ambassador. Um, and he says that he was more than merely homosexual. He had refinements <laughs> of sexual mania perverted with both sexes. And this, these were facts that were well known to his servants, to his associates, and to his wife. Uh, he threw these sort of bacchanals, these wild parties that were, uh, quote, usually, usually result in excesses, alcoholic and further. Guests, however, are hand-picked and hand-placed to excite romances among the various diplomatic corps that will give him an intimate insight to the private affairs of government circles. Um, so just a real, you know, sounds like a wild time. Uh, yeah, he's like he's having like orgies and like you know, and, and and just <laughs> building his network and getting information, yeah. right? But um, they do actually are able to infiltrate the Spanish embassy and they crack the 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 safe that has the codes for the cryptographic messaging system and whatnot. And this actually leads to the the first real spat between the intelligence community, what would become the CIA and the FBI, mm -hmm. which um, because the, you know the FBI under J Edgar Hoover. Their turf is domestic, right? The domestic counter espionage. And here you have the OSS, which is supposedly supposed to be doing, you know, foreign espionage. They're on the FBI's turf. Um, and the FBI actually gets these, gets Downs' men arrested. Um, and the next day, FDR has to call in uh, Bill, Bill Donovan and FDR, sorry, and uh, Hoover into the Oval Office and basically you know, yells at the two of them, what the hell's going on? You guys got to, right. you know, you got to figure this out. Um, and as you know, the FBI and the CIA would have turf battles, you know, oh, for, yeah. for decades, right? And you can kind of trace it back to Donald Downs stepping on J. Edgar Hoover's toes. I love that. And I love that what ultimately the source of the turf battle is also, <clears throat> to some degree, an embarrassment of the FBI because the right. OSS is successful in this yeah. operation. Right. They figure right. out how to get in and, and pull it off. Yeah. Um, let's say a word about Hoover <clears throat> now, because I feel like whenever we talk about, you know, gay people and, and gay history, Hoover yeah. is kind of the, the 700 pound gorilla. <laughs> um, uh, uh, you know, he is not as permissive and tolerant of gay people. No. Um, but of course, Hoover also he, he has the, 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 I mean, if it's legend or not, I'll let you talk about this, that, you know, that he was gay, that yeah. his longtime assistant was his partner. I mean, the accusations, he dressed in women's clothes. So, Talk a little bit about Hoover and how he sits in this history. I mean, sits he looms very large in it, but but say a bit about him, maybe even too in in this era of of FDR. Well, it is sort of one of the great paradoxes of of Washington, not just gay Washington, but Washington that the man who was overseeing all these uh, purges of gay people from the federal government and the collecting sexual secrets on other people was himself maybe. A closeted homosexual. I have no evidence of this. No one does. Mm -hmm. You know, the story that you alluded to, the cross-dressing, um, which is funny, you know, they, I would tell people I was working on a book about gay Washington, and most often the reaction would be something along the lines of, oh, well, Hoover's got to be in there. And, you yeah. know, he was a cross-dresser, right? And that story- Find his you know, dress, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that story had originated in a biography written by a British journalist in 1993, which should immediately make you suspicious. And <laughs> British journalist, right? But he, but he did, you know, he did the typical British journalist thing. He paid a widow of a mob boss who had dealings with Hoover, who basically told him this story that she was witness to J. Edgar Hoover, you know, in a dress involved in like depraved sexual acts with young boys. That's, mm -hmm. that's the- origins of this and then it and then it appears in the movie uh jay edgar that clint eastwood directs and it's widely believed but it's almost certainly not true yeah um but it is a fascinating bizarre aspect of all of this one that you know here he is he has this close relationship with clyde tolson his associate director they are eating lunch at the mayflower hotel every day uh they go on vacations together they're you know sitting at the racetrack together Clearly, people are, you know, whispering about this. And I, I write about it. That is from his very early days as director of the FBI, um, when it was still the Bureau of Investigation before it was formerly the FBI. You know, he's being written about in the popular press, um, all with these insinuations that they can't say it explicitly, but it's he's walking with a slight mince in his step. 
mm. or you know certain items of clothes that he's wearing, or they refer to one of the things I learned in this book was that um, a stereotypical gay male activity was antique collecting, mm-hmm. uh, and that was sort of so they would say that he you know he enjoys collecting antiques, and that was mm-hmm. sort of a wink and a nod, a wink and a nod, yeah. right? So people are referring to it, um, but he was incredibly. Um, paranoid about this and very sensitive. And there's a part of the book, it's actually one of my favorite parts of the book, just recounting all the many times that, you know, if you mentioned to someone that J. Edgar Hoover was a homosexual, um, there was a not small chance that it would, that you might get visited by the FBI. And there are all these examples of like, I start with these women playing bridge one day in Ohio. And one of them says that Hoover is a homosexual. It turns out one of the other ladies, her nephew is an agent in the FBI. She tells her nephew, who then sends this up the line to the director. And like the next day, the woman who said this at the bridge party, she's being called into the St. Louis or Chicago, I forget which one, uh, field office of the FBI and given a talking to by you know one of the special agents in charge, basically setting her straight, demanding to know where he heard this, why would you say such a thing about the director? And she leaves terrified and she says, not only am I apologizing to you, I'm going to tell all the women at, the, at our next weekly bridge party that it was that I don't know what, I don't know where I, I got this from. It's completely wrong. And this would happen multiple times. There are all these reports of agents basically tracking down rumors of people, just random America, random U.S. citizens mm-hmm. exercising their free speech rights to gossip right. about our leaders, right? Right, and they right. would basically read them the riot act. Um, it's crazy when you think about it today, but it was. And it, was and it really real. is like the stereotype of of Hoover, right? Is this person who was thin skinned, petty, had vendettas, yeah. and used information about people yes. to try and ruin them, right? Uh, and you tell pretty compelling stories about that in the book too. Did you did you talk about a little bit about you know this is maybe trying to get inside his head and psychoanalyzing a bit, but like what is his what is his aversion at least as you know as it's expressed in his actions to gay people? Why, why did he find them so threatening? And was that unusual? Well, yeah, I mean, I think he obviously had a particularly paranoid and vindictive aspect to his character in general. But the view that, you know, gay people were immoral, uh, criminal, mentally ill, these were widely held views. These were not unusual views at all. They were held across the political spectrum. Liberals felt this way. Conservatives felt this way. There was pretty much a unanimity of opinion on this. Um, And what's interesting is that the view that they are national security threats, that is what changes with America's, you know, rise to kind of global superpower status, right? So before World War II, all those negative um, attributes about gay people, those were widely held. Uh, Those were basically based on religious prejudice, you could say. Um, But all that changes once America becomes... Um, once, once it enters into World War II and it needs to start developing a bureaucratic apparatus for the collection and the maintenance of secret information. And then homosexuality goes from being a sin to a national security threat. And the fear is that gay people are more vulnerable to blackmail. Mm-hmm. And this is, this is, this, I actually trace this back to go back to the espionage. I trace this back to a, um, a World War I era Austrian colonel, a name of Colonel Alfred Radl, who's in the Austro-Hungarian, he's the head of the Austro-Hungarian counterintelligence service. And he is discovered in 1913, so around the eve of World War I, they, the Austro-Hungarian intelligence service, they discover that he is himself uh, a spy for Imperial Russia. Uh, he happens to have been gay there's no evidence, in fact, much evidence to the contrary that his being gay had anything to do with it. He wasn't blackmailed. He was doing it for money, like a lot of spies do. But this was so embarrassing to the Austro-Hungarian uh, intelligence service that their own counterintelligence director was himself a spy, that they basically promote this narrative that he was homosexual and he was blackmailed because of his homosexuality into working for the Russians. In this story, just takes on this like almost mythological status in the West among Western intelligence professionals. So Alan Dulles, who gets his start in the OSS, he's the first civilian director of the CIA. He writes about this in multiple books that he's published decades later. 
Um, it's given in evidence in 1950, I believe. Yes, in 1950, the then director of the CIA, he's asked for, you know, can you point to any evidence that of, of gays being spies, being blackmailed? The one example he gives is Colonel Radel, which is, you know, from World War One, before World War One. Um, so it, it just, you know, I'm, I'm sure if you were to interview, if, if, if there were still spies of that generation alive today, this is the sort of thing that they would talk about, right? They the Radel the case. We all yeah. know about that case. And then it turns out when they opened up the Russian archives after the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, and, they, and they could actually look at his, his handler in, in, in the records, they didn't even know he was gay, the Russians, right? So this wasn't a part of uh, the reason why he sold secrets, but it, it assumes this, this mythic status yeah. in the minds of our mid-century intelligence professionals. And, and one that and it just carries on for decades, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I had never heard Radel's story mm. until I read, read it in your book. And, you know, my understanding and for, for, you know, decades of the two decades I've covered the intelligence community, when you talk to people about, you know, before, you know, b before there was an executive order to basically make it that being gay was not a reason right. that your security clearance could be revoked. It was just that it was common knowledge, like, well, of course, you know, it was a problem being gay because you could be blackmailed. Yeah. Right. And it was just sort of assumed that that was the reason. And then people would often say, and then, of course, now that we're more open and tolerant, the best thing is, of course, to come out because then they can't hold it out over exactly. you. Um, and so that kind of like mythology took on and just became sort of conventional wisdom, even though it's based in a story that's that's actually off base because yeah. the guy didn't become a spy because he was gay. He became a spy because he was, you know, greedy and acquisitive yeah. and, <laughs> right. um, and to fund his lifestyle. Um, and I, but it's interesting too the 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 way that there were there are characters who show up in the story, you know, early on in the, in the FDR era as well, you know, who were gay and didn't think it was a problem because they expressly said like, well, there's nothing that I have nothing mm. to hide. I couldn't be blackmailed. So that idea was already present back then as well. Yeah. Before yeah, gays became this sinister kind of menace. Right. There's this great character, Carmel Offie. That's where I was going to go who's, next. Yeah. Who's this, <laughs> this fascinating. And he, he pops up. If you read some of the histories of the CIA, he, he pops up as kind of a, figure in the background. Um, and he starts off as a diplomat um, uh, working for William Bullitt, the first ambassador to the Soviet Union. And he is basically described by everyone who knows him as this just sort of flamboyantly gay character. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very unusual because there, there weren't many people like this. And for whatever reason, he's sort of able to get away with it. I have to imagine he was very good at his job. Mm -hmm. Right. And so William Bullitt, um, who's a character in the first couple chapters, um, basically protects him, you know, and, and Offie is involved in torpedoing the career of Sumner Wells. Right. So he's a gay man, but he's using accusations of homosexuality against another gay man, which is something that unfortunately happens quite often in this yeah. book. I mean, the closet makes people do really terrible, awful things. But then after World War II, Offie is one of the basically one of the founding fathers of the of the CIA, um, and he's he's working uh, under diplomatic cover. He's 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 part of the State Department, um, but he's but he's really with the CIA, and he becomes really one of the first victims of the kind of bureaucratic war that goes on between the FBI and the CIA in the early years of the Cold War. Yeah, when McCarthy and Hoover and the FBI are basically accusing the CIA of harboring leftists and communists, which there were. There were a lot of leftists and former communists in the OSS during World War II because they were our allies, right? Yeah. And a lot yeah. of them stayed on afterwards. Um, and to Hoover, this is in McCarthy, this is obviously unthinkable that you could have anyone left of center, right, involved in the war against communism. And one of the weapons that they use are, are these accusations of homosexuality. Mm -hmm. um, and this also points to an interesting kind of cultural difference between the two institutions and that the FBI was sort of the preserve of Catholic, hev heavily Catholic and sort of white ethnics, right? So we're talking Poles, Czechs, Central and Eastern Europeans, people of that uh, ethnic background. It's a more culturally conservative institution. You know, J. Edgar Hoover makes everyone... Uh, you know, they have to get a certain type of haircut. They have to wear a certain type of, you know, uh, suit and jacket and tie. I mean, it's, it's a very regimental conservative culture. 
uh, blue collar or working class, you know, middle class, working, working class, blue, more and more of a blue collar institution uh, where the CIA is the preserve of wasps, right? Very well educated, boarding school, private school. They're, you could say they're more tolerant of eccentricities, mm-hmm. um, you know, more to, so therefore more tolerant of homosexuality somewhat. There's a Daniel Patrick Moynihan had a great line about uh, in the age of the security clearance, it was the Harvard men who were checked and the Fordham men doing the checking, which really kind of de- describes the kind of, you know, so it wasn't just turf battles that the FBI and the CIA were engaged in. It was a real, di- it was a real different cultural yeah. attitude towards many different things, towards foreign policy, towards um, American society. These were very different institutions. And secrecy permeates all of this. I mean, as you, as you, you really, <clears throat> part of this book is such an interesting history of the intelligence community and the security mm. state as something growing up in this kind of World War II and post-war era where the ability to collect information is, is powerful, but the ability to keep it secret is the need to keep it secret is important and that people accrue power through secrecy and that security clearance and background checks and these things that become integral to that architecture that is washington it is national power starts to that this is the root the era that it takes hold in yeah absolutely and the ability to wield um a security clearance or the to, to to take it back or to revoke it becomes extremely important um, and in 1953, after um, basically running for office on one of their one of their campaign planks was to clean out the homosexuals in Washington, the Republicans come into power in 19 in 1953 after that election. Um, and one of the first executive orders that Eisenhower signs is 10450, which bars gay people from working for the federal government. But more importantly, and at least in terms of this conversation, is it denies them security clearances. Um, which basically makes it uh, very difficult for any sort of for a gay person to advance at all in this city. There's to, to spend a little moment, another moment on Carmel Offey. There's yeah. this, you open the chapter with this this great kind of vivid image. And I'll just read it so people get a sense of him too. You start by saying, visiting a Moscow fur market, quote as well guarded as Fort Knox. C.L. Salzberger, the chief foreign correspondent for the New York Times, was startled by what he saw. Quote. Imagine our astonishment when we were finally conducted into a large storeroom and there, amid a pile of furs, only his head showing, the grinning Carmel Offey, Salzberger recorded in a 1947 diary entry. Offey was acting as if he owned the place, quote, heaving pelts about and saying, I'll take this, not that, this, not that. What an operator. I still don't know how he got there. (laughs) I mean, that guy is like the perfect intelligence officer. How in the world did he get? in there. And I mean, I think that this, I love that story because on the one hand, it is like this very vivid image of this like flamboyant kind of man, like going through fur pelts and whatever. And that's kind of funny and it's amusing and it fits with an image that we have of flamboyant people. But then there's the question like, no, how the hell did he get in there? How did you get into a Moscow (laughs) fur market? And I think that it's such a, there, there, he's kind of this example of somebody who has this ability. I don't know if it's through charm or through his basic tradecraft, but he is at the center of some of the more important intelligence operations yeah. uh, of the early uh, OSS and then into the, into the post-war era. It's, yeah. it's really, he's kind of a founding father of American intelligence. Yeah, he is. He is. And I say in the book that, you know, uh, he probably deserves his own biography. Yeah. Uh, and, and I don't that might, and that would be very hard to write because the documentary record just isn't there, but mm-hmm. no, he's a fascinating, he's a fascinating character. And you, you can read more about him in um, The Old Boys, which is a book I'd recommend by Burton Hirsch, which I don't know if you've read that, but it's a, it's one I would recommend. It's on, it's on the early founding of the, of the CIA. You, you talk about the, the record being thin and, and I want to skip ahead actually, but I'll come back to some, go mm-hmm. out of chronological order here. And um, to one of the stories I actually found pretty, one of the more tragic stories. Mm-hmm. And this gets to the question of, is the record thin because the record is just kind of erased of people? Uh, and it's the story of Arthur Vandenberg Jr., yeah. who is someone who, as you write, is basically relegated to a footnote in the annals of the history of Dwight Eisenhower, President Eisenhower. Talk about who he was and why he is so barely remembered. So he's the son of Arthur Vandenberg Sr., the senator from Michigan, 
um, who famously went from being an isolationist to being a supporter of American engagement abroad. Uh, his famous line that you know foreign foreign policy should stop at the water's edge. Um, he his son uh, Art Jr. Uh, starts the Citizens for Eisenhower, which is basically the draft Eisenhower uh, movement to get Eisenhower to run for the, Rep the Republican nomination. So he's instrumental in Ike's election. And then after Ike's victory in 1952, he is preparing to be uh, appointments secretary uh, or secretary of the cabinet. This is not a job that exists anymore, but it's a very important job. It's not it's chief of staff, powerful. but it's basically running the the cabinet. Who gets which jobs, yeah. Yeah, a very important job. And in December of 1952, uh, J. Edgar Hoover comes to meet with Ike at the transition headquarters in New York City and presents him with the evidence that he's gay, Art Jr.'s gay. Uh, and basically says to him, we won't investigate this further if he doesn't take this job. So it's basically a threat to Ike, you know, basically, and it's, you know, this is, you want to talk about how secrets and, and are, are used, you know, not only to just sort of destroy an individual's life, but imagine what Eisenhower is thinking sitting in that first meeting as in the incoming president with J. Edgar Hoover. Uh, and he's basically, you know, he's telling him who's boss in a way, right? right? He's like, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen to this guy. Um, and then they drop him. They, 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 uh, he has, he, he sort of goes on with this sort of public face that he's sick. He checks himself into a hospital. They tell the press that he's, you know, absent because of, uh, of illness. Um, but then finally in April, they announced that he won't be taking a job. And by that point, he's basically forgotten. So the, the media doesn't go in and investigate it. Um, and he goes down to Florida to teach at the University of Miami. Um, and he's kind of, a, he's, he's a ruined man. But then what really is awful is that in 1956, really out of nowhere, uh, this magazine called Confidential Magazine, which was really sort of the first supermarket tabloid, um, the scandal magazines that you, that, that, started in the 1950s. This was the leading one. It was widely read, millions of subscribers. Uh, really out of nowhere, it outs him. We, we, didn't, we didn't have that term at that time, mm -hmm. but it outs him in a really disparaging um, article. Uh, and it basically drives him into alcoholism. Um, and he dies, basically drinks himself to death. And it's a real tragic story. And there are so many others like that one. Uh, countless stories that we'll never know. Yeah. Uh, this one we happen to know because we have the FBI records and he was publicly outed. Um, and I tell, I tell other stories like that one, but um, it's, yeah, it's very sad. How much did you feel when you were, uh, I presumed in to, to many cases, discovering these people yeah. you know, as you're doing the research, you know, probably hadn't heard of them. Did you feel that you were, kind of restoring a reputation for them or like, or maybe setting something right. I mean, I would, I, I, I found myself having very emotional reactions to these stories as a reader and, and imagined what it would have been like to be discovering them as a journalist, as an historian and thinking, you know, I've got an opportunity here to, to tell someone's story in a way that, that was simply never told because they had such an unfortunate ending. Yeah, I did. And I tried to be very sensitive about it because these are, very personal stories. They're dealing with people's personal lives. Oftentimes there's sexual details involved mm -hmm. in these stories. Um, and I tried to be respectful. Yes. And I, and I did feel obviously a personal connection with these people because if I had been born in this era, that would have been me, you know, yeah. or it would have been, and I think anyone reading this book who's gay has to, has to feel that reading about yeah. these people. Um, and it really makes you think, you know, how would I have behaved? Mm -hmm. um, what would I have done? It made me, mm -hmm. I can say on this issue of outing, it made me, I was, I was already pretty anti-outing. I mean, there mm -hmm. are rare circumstances in which I think outing is appropriate. But this, this book really made me um, appreciate um, how difficult it was to be gay in this era, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's, 
you you might have seen or your readers might have seen the story about Ed Koch that the New York Times published a couple yeah. weeks ago that posthumously outed him. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when he was alive, uh, he wasn't doing enough on AIDS. And he was, you know, Larry Kramer was his main antagonist. Uh, right. They lived in the same apartment building. Um, and he would constantly attack Koch. They would gay bait him, basically accuse him of being gay, right? And... I can understand as a gay person why you might feel angry at another gay person who has political power, who might not be doing enough. And the feeling that he's not doing enough because he doesn't want to be seen as gay because he's in the closet and doesn't want to be exposed. At the same time, Ed Koch grew up under the specter of the lavender scare. You know, he grew up under a period when gay people were hounded out of the federal government. And let's just think, I mean, this is a man who represented Greenwich Village. He came mm -hmm. from the site of the Stonewall Uprising. He came from probably the most pro-gay district in America. And yet he himself did not feel that he could come out of the closet. And you can say that that's not courageous or cowardly or whatever. My ultimate feeling or sentiment when I read about someone like that is sadness. Mm -hmm. I feel sad for that person. I feel terrible for that person. Mm -hmm. It's not, I don't want to go out and out them and, and attack them. I feel, I mean, the villain in this situation, and I think in the book itself, the villain is the closet, yeah. right? The villain isn't necessarily, I mean, J. Edgar Hoover is a villain, obviously. Roy Cohn is a villain. Um, these kinds of, you know, these closeted anti-gay Republicans, they're all kind of villainous in some way. But the real villain, the real overarching villain is the closet. It's the societal paranoia or fear that our society used to have um, around gay people that, that caused people to behave this way. So, I mean, and, you, and actually, in, in, in the, from the first words of your book, I think you actually capture this so well. And I was really moved by your dedication. You write, mm -hmm. for my family and for all those who unburdened themselves of their secrets so that I did not have to live with mine. Yeah. And, you know, as you know, I think any gay person reads that and they get a little bit of a lump in their throat mm -hmm. because you understand all of the sacrifices and all of the suffering that people had to go through to get us to this point. And right. I mean, I, I don't know how you feel. I mean, I moved to DC in the late 1990s and I was not yet out, but I came out not long after that, but the world was changing very quickly. And, you know, it was clear that it was, it was a safer place to be out than it was before. And I remember as a young person learning about Larry Kramer and Frank Kameny and all these people and kind yeah. of looking around at my generation and being like, you got, we, we have no idea yeah. what these people went exactly. through and like kids today. You know right. what I mean? Right. You I find yeah. yourself frustrated with them too. Yeah. No. And I felt a, a responsibility doing this. And I say this in the introduction, but you know, gayness is not a heritable trait, right? right. So every gay generation is born afresh and you don't have um, a relative or a family um, in the same way that a Jewish person or an African American or an Irish American, that's how the you know your kind of cultural history is passed down at the dinner table, right? Through your your older generations, your grandparents. Gay yeah. people don't have that. Right. They have to discover this all for themselves. And so that I think you asked me, you know, why did I write this book? That was a large part of it, was because I felt like I don't know the history of like my people. Yeah. You know, in the same way that I do. Uh, say, you know, I'm Jewish, right? So the same way I know about Jewish traditions and right. Jewish history and whatnot. Um, so I think I think that's, I felt a real sort of duty in doing this um, to the kind of generations that came before. Was Larry Kramer someone who helped you understand your gay story? He did. Um, and I'm, it's actually one of my great regrets, professional regrets that he is no longer with us because I think he really would have loved this book or I, I would have loved to have known so, what he too. thought about it. I think he would have loved the book. Um, and yeah, he totally inspired me. I mean, Larry could be, let's just say, not the most exact person in his <laughs> his writing about history. Yeah. You know, he ended up writing at the end of his life this two-part novel called The American People in which he basically, you know, everyone is gay in this book. You know, George Washington is gay. Alexander Hamilton is gay. Everyone is gay in this book. And I think he did that because he knew that, you know, he wasn't a historian. He was a, he was more of a novelist, right? And so he could, he could kind of get away with, with, with doing it that way. But um, 
I think what I learned from him was was the was the importance of homosexuality as an idea, as a phenomenon in history. I think that's something that he understood. That's something that he imparted to me. And I think that's that's really what I think the book is about, is basically saying, look, there's this thing called homosexuality, and it's more than just, you know, your neighbors, Bob and Steve, who are married. It it has all these cultural and political implications to it and how our society has viewed it and dealt with it, and it's been used to explain certain phenomena, other phenomena. Um, it ties into all of our presidents and their administrations. Um, uh, and it has this kind of profound social significance, and that's that's what I was trying to convey in this and book. It, it, that absolutely comes across, and <clears throat> it makes me think as we're talking about one of my – I will say regrets, I think, is, you know, when I moved to D.C. in the late 90s, um, you know, DuPont Circle and quickly Logan Circle were still sort of gay meccas of the city. You know, there were gay bars, there were gay neighborhoods when we talked about the gayberhood. And as a young gay man, having kind of finding my tribe and learning about that culture and being steeped in it and seeing how it was both integrated into the city, but distinct from it as well was tremendous and liberating and great fun and i feel like i look around dc now and you live here too and i'm like there is no gay neighborhood anymore yeah everybody it's all integrated and on the one hand i think oh that's wonderful that's a sign of progress and you know straight people hang out in gay bars and there really is i mean there are gay bars but they're not exclusively gay anymore but there's something that i miss as well and I, i i kind of miss a little bit of the ghettoization uh, of it. And it's not because I want gay people to be separate or right. Cause I want them to not be, you know, obviously I want us all to have mm-hmm. rights and be included, but there's something special that I feel kind of gets lost. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Do you, do you feel that way? I do. And one of the funny moments in the book is I'm writing about the 1970s, which were a, a really important decade. I mean, they're all important decades, but it was significant in that that was really when sort of gay people were coming out of the closet and the, the, the kind of Berlin wall that separated gay and straight society starts to kind of crack. And this is the rise of, um, they called super bars. There these gay discos in Southeast mm-hmm. DC. And they were so popular that straight people wanted to go to them. Yeah. Like um, tracks, other places. Yeah. Like and straight street. people wanted to go to them. And this is, you know, you started, you started having gay, there's this old, there's a story in the Washington post with um, one of the owners of one of these bars basically complaining about you know all these straight people that are taking up all the room at our at our bars and you you hear this a lot now but like to actually go back and see when that when that complaint began because now you know it's like all the gay bars it's all like bachelorette parties and whatnot and right there's some gay bars that are you'd think that they're basically straight bars at this point sure um it's almost become kind of a trope right of kind of complaining about that but to actually see where when it started like in the mid 70s that was that was amusing and it, and it and it's a, it's such an interesting maybe unexpected thing for some people and maybe for straight people too is that because so much of the gay civil rights movement is built on tearing down those walls but there yeah. is still a desire to keep some of them up and I mean it's not that hard to to think about people do like to sort of associate with their tribe um but the secrecy aspect of course is gone when you're in a gay bar and I mean and it's one of the things that I find so remarkable about living in Washington is it was still kind of a little bit novel to be out in the workplace when I got here, but just a little bit, like at the very yeah. tail end of it. And now it's just like, you know, I don't feel remotely unusual at all. I mean, right. I, I refer to my husband. Everyone knows him. It's it's not being gay is no longer. Um, uh, it, it's not it, it doesn't feel like it has at least in Washington. It doesn't feel like it has that same risk that it once yes. did, which into the core themes of your book that paranoia around gay people in the security apparatus is, I, mean, I, I don't think it exists anymore. I mean, no. it would be bizarre. No, it doesn't. And I think no. that sort of felt like now is the right time to write this book because I feel like I'm closing a chapter yeah. on gay history in the book. So it starts with FDR and it ends with Bill Clinton lifting the ban on security clearances in 95, right. which is not to say that there wasn't gay history being made after that. Clearly there was. Yeah, but it had more to do with the civil rights aspects of the gay rights movement, which is not really what my book is about. My book is about this issue of secrecy in the nation's mm-hmm. capital, right? And so I think the kind of bookends for that are, you know, World War II until the end of the 
Cold War. Let's let's jump in in our in our time we have left here with one more famous famous case, which listeners will I'm sure know tons about, and there's been so much written about it, which is the Hiss Chambers affair. Mm. Um, so uh, start by just reminding people who who the the, the thumbnail of what yeah. that was all about, and then let's get into how this the secret gay life or not mm. gay life <laughs> informs that story. So yeah, so Whitaker Chambers was a uh, senior editor at Time Magazine, um, a very pr- which was a, a, a very well known. Uh, I wouldn't say he was he was a very um, erudite uh, and quite well known journalist, conservative journalist. And in 1948, he makes a shocking claim that he had been in uh, a messenger in the communist underground in the 1930s, and that Alger Hiss who was a high-ranking State Department official. He was the U.S. delegate to the first meeting of the United Nations in San Francisco, um, that he had been a communist spy. And this is the trial of the century, right? I mean, there are many, there have been many trials of the century since, but this is sort of, was known for that era as the trial of the century, and it becomes a a national saga. And um, Hiss is associated with all the great progressive figures of the era, um, he had he had been uh, a clerk to Oliver Wendell Holmes, um, Harvard educated, just you know the kind of paragon of Eastern establishment correctness and refinement, right? Mm-hmm. And Chambers is this kind of sloppily dressed, overweight guy with bad teeth. He's a former communist. He seems untrustworthy, um, and sort of underneath the official story that everyone's talking about, this very dramatic spy drama, is this suspicion that perhaps the two men had been gay lovers. Um, and the origins of this are, are the fact that you know Chambers had a gay past. He uh, confessed it to the FBI because he was afraid that he might, that the Hiss forces might use this against him during their confrontation. Um, and it's never publicly mentioned at the time, again, just to show you the extent to which this was such a taboo subject. Um, so no one actually ever, you know, openly uses the word homosexual. Um, Hiss uses the word queer Mm -hmm. several times to describe Chambers, which had a different meaning in 1948 than it does today. So these sort of hints and, 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 uh, insinuations, um, and then during Hiss's perjury trial, there are two perjury trials because he, the statute of limitations on espionage had expired, but he was tried for perjury. They basically accused Chambers of being um, mentally insane. So that's the kind of defense strategy. And they were considering accusing him of being a spurned homosexual. And they basically start a whisper campaign against him. But they decide not to in the end because there's a real fear that if you know, if they expose or if they accuse Chambers of being homosexual, it'll boomerang back on Hiss. That even even though Hiss is not gay, and there's no evidence that he was, just the mere inclination or the mere the mere inkling that he might be would be so damaging that you know what, it's just not worth the risk. It's not worth doing. And it's fascinating because Richard Nixon, this is his real first emergence on the national political scene. He's a young congressman from California who's on the House on American Activities Committee, and he champions Chambers. And decades later, um, he believes, Nixon believes that the two of them are lovers, actually. He's one of the few people who believes that they're both lovers and that Hiss is guilty. Um, but he believes this, and it, sort, and it, and it, it kind of obsesses him um, as president when they're trying to go after Daniel Ellsberg, the leaker of the Pentagon Papers. Nixon has it in his mind that Ellsberg must be a homosexual, and that if we can only get this information, if we can only get the proof that he's a homosexual, we'll be able to destroy him, which is what prompts him to get the plumbers to go break into um, Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office. Um, Later, when there's a leak of information from his administration to a newspaper columnist, um, he's convinced that the leaker and the newspaper columnist are gay lovers, that there's no other explanation for how these two people could know each other. It turns out they were members of the same church, um, but it just it kind not of, what he thought. Yeah, yeah, it just shows you that because of the secrecy that surrounded it, that homosexuality was something that people would reach to to explain things. Right, so we ha- we don't really get what's going on here between Hiss and Chambers. It's really mysterious. Maybe they're gay lovers, 
and I actually didn't know this until recently. I was watching the movie um, Richard Jewell about mm. the the man who the the security guard at the Atlanta Olympics in 1996 who was falsely accused of planting a bomb. And at one point, the FBI developed a theory that he and his best friend, um, because they were communicating a lot, I think by phone, that they were gay lovers and accomplices, right? Because they couldn't understand why he was calling this guy so much who happened to be his best friend. It had to have been some kind of nefarious gay angle to it. Um, and, you know, even today, I think, you know, with this kind of rhetoric about groomers that we're seeing yes. a lot in public debate, right? It's this sort of echoing, this kind of recurring um, obsession or paranoia around homosexuality is a sort of dark force that's lurking in the shadows. Um, much, that's, that's, that's a theme of the book, too. How much do you think, too, that that which because clearly there's this <clears throat> kind of paranoia about fear and fear about homosexuality as this sinister force that is independent of, you know, the national security state, because you see it popping up in so many contexts. But the national security apparatus in the culture of it is deeply paranoid. I mean, in some ways for good reason, you think spies are being run against you. But mm -hmm. here, I wonder how much you came away thinking that the kind of the paranoia that exists in many contexts around gay people is something that kind of rubbed off specifically on the security culture and may and fueled its paranoia or even was responsible for much of it? Or is it just that, or are those two not necessarily connected? You know, that's an interesting um, question you ask. And it's not something I've considered. It's something I should consider. It sounds like something you might want to write about, Shane, because you know Maybe. a lot more. You know a lot more about that than I do. Um, gay, fear of gay people is what created paranoia in the intelligence community. But it's I think not it James did, Angleton. But I do think I do think a lot of the um, paranoia about communists in the 1950s mm. it had a lot to do, and it was often conflated with a kind of sex panic. And that communists and homosexuals, you know, the homosexuals were sexual deviants and therefore they were political deviants. And that there was this connection from one to the other. Um, in the language that they would often describe, they used to describe communists was um, sometimes sexual in nature, that they, 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 that they were, you know, r r uh, penetrating society or um, uh, the use of the word deviant. Mm -hmm. You know, political deviance, sexual deviance. There's a lot of um, correlation between these two themes and fears, right? Um, and again, just you know, it's ironic, right? That that someone like Hoover himself might have been a sexual deviant, right? Yeah, even though he's the most upstanding, uptight guy in Washington, um, who's at war against these forces, may have himself uh, been one. And he's buried next to Clive Tolson, isn't he? Yeah, it? it's one of the funny, well, funny. In, in, I, say, I, I end the book on this because it's sort of heartwarming. But yes, Tolson is buried like 20 feet from Hoover at Congressional Cemetery. And in the 1980s, a man named uh, Leonard Matlovich, who was the first gay soldier to challenge the ban on gays in the military in 1975, he died of AIDS and he decided that he wanted to be buried. Um, he wanted to start basically a... Um, he wanted to create a monument for gay people to honor their ancestors, right? So he wanted um, a corner of Congressional Cemetery to basically become this gay corner. So he he gets a plot as close as he can to J. Edgar Hoover. And he has a very famous headstone. It says, I was given um, two purple hearts um, for killing a man and a discharge for loving one. It's a very moving... It's great, yeah. A very moving headstone. But then after he dies... All these other gay people start buying up plots in Congressional Cemetery near um, uh, Matlevich's headstone and J. Edgar Hoover. So, J. Edgar, if you go there today, the Congressional Cemetery, you will see all these gay people's burial plots. And there are rainbow flags and it, there are couples buried next to each other. Um, and it's kind of a final, you know fuck you to Jay, to Jay Edgar Hoover. It's very moving actually. Yeah, no, it, it, it is, it is pretty great. And it's a, <clears throat> and I, and I hope that young gay people especially will go there and yeah. we'll see that and, and read your book obviously too. Um, so it is our tradition on chatter that the very last question 
mm. over interview, is I reach into the chatter box, which oh. I have right here in front of me, and I am going to select at random a previously written question. Okay. Which may or may not involve homosexuals or demons. Oh, interesting. We'll see. We'll see. Let's see what happens. Oh, this has absolutely nothing okay. to do with the subject of your book. Okay. <laughs> but you being a, someone who has written a lot about foreign policy, you've yeah. written a lot about Russia, you've written a lot about superpower politics, this is a good one. Mm. Should we ban all nuclear weapons? <laughs> ban <laughs> nuclear weapons? Um, well, we've tried to ban nuclear weapons, and I feel like it hasn't worked. Yeah. Um, I'm actually, I'm actually not sure it would be a good thing either, to be honest. I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there are international relations theorists who have probably, who have argued that the fact that the Soviet Union and the United States were nuclear armed powers meant that they did not get into a conventional war. Yeah. There were obviously lots of other conventional wars during the Cold War, all sorts of proxy wars and whatnot. But had there not been this, this threat of global destruction, then perhaps there would have been massive bloodshed through through a conventional war, like we saw in World War II, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm not I'm not even sure that even if we had the power to just, just wave a magic wand and remove all nuclear weapons, I'm not sure it would necessarily be a good thing. You, I'll ask one more question. You, yeah. You've reported a lot on Russia. Uh, uh, memorably uh, protested in front of RT, uh, yes. uh, uh, which was great. People can go <laughs> look look that up uh, online. Uh, do you? Worry that Vladimir Putin would actually use a nuclear weapon in this conflict? I mean, it, we, we, or maybe even like if that's too big of a question, when you're thinking about like how far would he go uh, mm. in the current war? I mean, what, what is on your mind as you think about that? You know, I have to think that someone in the Russian command structure would, would prevent that from happening. Yeah. Again, I'm not an expert on, on the Russian nuclear command structure. Right. I've actually heard that they're quite conservative there's some sort of connection between that and maybe the rest of the russian orthodox church it's, mm -hmm. it has its own sort of internal culture mm -hmm. um and so they might even be to the right of vladimir putin or more nationalistic i don't know but um my my former colleague at brookings fiona hill who probably knows more about putin than anyone yeah she has said that 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 she thinks that there are circumstances in which he might he might do that yeah which is enough to keep you up at night so. The Cold War is back again, my friend. Yeah. It is really something. Um, well, Jamie Kerchick, thank you. Uh, thank you. Great to see this book in the world. I know how hard you worked on it, and you've always been such a superb journalist and chronicle and writer and observer. Um, people should go get Secret City, The Hidden History of Gay Washington. It is a big book. I promise you it is highly readable. Uh, it is compulsive in some parts in terms of how wonderful it is to read uh these are great stories and it's an important one so thank you for writing the book and thank you for coming on to talk about it thank you for that endorsement it was a lot of fun that was chatter a production of lawfare and goat rodeo please subscribe to the podcast and find us on twitter at that was chatter 